You're listening to Inclusive AF with Jackie Clayton and Katie Van Horn. All right. Welcome, welcome, welcome. This is Katie Van Horn uh, with the Inclusive AF podcast. I am uh, solo today without my sweet friend Jackie because she is somewhere up in the air above the United States. I don't even know where at this point, but uh, we have a very special guest that we are excited about. Uh, So Maria, I will turn it over to you to introduce yourself and then we'll jump right in. Thank you, Katie. Hello, everyone. My name is Maria Marukian. I use the pronoun she, her, and I'm the president of a small uh, consulting business that is based in Washington, D.C., called MSM Global Consulting. And MSM Global's mission is really focused on organizational culture transformation, leadership development, uh, with the lens around diversity, equity, and inclusion. Our whole focus is on helping leaders at all levels of the organization uh, really create sustainable change to build thriving organizations for everybody. Awesome. Very cool. And uh, DC, you're in DC today. So how is the sky in DC? It is much better today. We actually were able to, I was able to walk my kids to school without anyone wearing masks. So that was nice. But yeah, the last couple of days have been a little, little gross out there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I I hope that, I mean, this, uh, we're in that season now of fires and hopefully we don't have too many of them. I'm, uh, you know, I'm in Arizona. And so, you know, we, we always have to worry about our fires and then also California's fires. So Hopefully we can have a, a calm summer and fall um, and, you know, we'll go from there. But yeah, the, I saw some pictures from back east and it looked yucky. So glad it's clearing up. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I want to jump right into, you know, my my questions, because I, I love this idea because I think I, I can't tell you how many organizations right now I'm talking to that are in the midst of some sort of transformation change you know how do we evolve and you know really become a company of the future so uh, i i would love to start off with how you got into this work but then also kind of you know how do you approach this work when you're working with a new organization absolutely so i've been in this space for about 20 years now i started my career I uh, really first and foremost wanting to focus on this in more of a global setting, uh, providing intercultural competence training for expats, for people who were going to be coming to the United States, really looking at it um, in terms of cultural identity factors. And uh, once I started doing that work, I began to realize that there was so, so much nuance Uh, when we were talking about and training around cultural identity when it came to power societal advantages and oppression, and that if we're not having those conversations, we're really not doing anyone any justice uh, in terms of being able to navigate these cultural differences. So that really uh, was a, a, a strong changing point, I think, in my career and also my personal life as a as a white identifying cisgender woman doing this work, uh, recognizing that there are also a lot of different uh, lenses and blind spots that I was bringing with me into the learning space. Uh, So that transitioned into, I worked in the nonprofit world for quite some time, uh, providing DEI uh, leadership initiatives and training and facilitation for other nonprofits, uh, education, healthcare, a lot of more sort of social oriented organizations, and then moved into the federal government living in DC. Many of us uh, spend (laughs) some period of time working in and around government. And so I joined the the State Department. And I spent a number of years as a leadership development specialist and DEI practitioner internally at state. Uh, Then I spent a little bit of time in a corporate uh, consulting company and then really just there was a there was a calling for me, I think, to uh, to open up my own uh, organization, really because I saw that there was there was an ever present gap in this work, mm-hmm. and the gap was really related to, and I think we see it nowadays, you know, as well, and have many of us in the DEI field have been talking about this, that um, oftentimes DEI initiatives are really seen more from a training lens and even more so from a 
you know, from a performative lens, whether that's intentional or not, uh, really just scratching the surface, let's throw some training at the problem and fix it. Or let's, uh, let's hire some more people who are underrepresented and that will quote unquote fix the problem rather than looking at this as a true systemic change process that takes time, that takes effort, that takes resources, and sometimes years to start to really move the needle. So that was something that I felt passionate about and really wanted to center my, my time, my effort, my work around. Uh, and so I've had MSM Global Consulting for almost 10 years now and uh, going strong. We've got a team of four now, full-time staff, plus a number of external facilitators, consultants, practitioners that, uh, that support our efforts. Awesome. That's so cool. I, um, I'm rereading a culture map and, you know, and I think it's one of those books that, you know, as you think about the global view of cultures and how you, you know, just the way people approach work and how different it is. And, and, you know, using the lens, like you said, your blind spots that you have coming into working with folks globally, it just is so fascinating to kind of think about the different approaches and the the, just the ways that people work differently across the globe. So I, I love that you're focused on that and that you're thinking about that. When you were with the Department of State, I, like I am uh, going to make an assumption that you were working with some of the folks that were traveling overseas and developing some of those skills. So how was that? Yes, it was really fascinating. We did work with both uh, Americans serving overseas as well as their uh, foreign national counterparts. Um, and, and in addition to that, civil service folks who mostly were stationed in and around the domestic United States. So the, it was an interesting, many interesting organizational dynamics in terms of, you know, in any organizational culture, there's us and them. Uh, and people tend to gravitate toward, you know, folks who are like them. And in addition to that being based on gender identity and age and racial identity, there were also some of these interesting cultural elements around us versus them related to what your job function was, were you foreign service versus civil service versus locally engaged staff. And um, when we dug under the surface, a lot of what I started to see, especially in my not only my facilitation, but my one-on-one -on -one coaching with leaders at all levels across state was uh, that there was often this uh, explicit idea that, well, because I work overseas, because I've devoted my career to, uh, to global and international diplomacy, check the box, I got this cultural competence thing. <laughs> And then, have, wait, and then I would have conversations with the locally engaged staff with the foreign service nationals, and they would say, yeah, not so much. Right. <laughs> so, so there was definitely a divide. And, um, you know, one of the things that always struck me from my conversations with the, with the locally engaged staff uh, was, we're the majority of the workforce in the embassy, and yet we are constantly being expected to assimilate to an American workplace. And we accept that when we join this organization, but we also see that there are some, there are some pretty strong disconnects and, and when our American counterparts aren't being more intentional, trying to understand, we lose so much. We lose so much in terms of the richness of our relationships. And also we, we lose so much in terms of productivity and performance and relationship building. So it was, it was really, I thought uh, incredibly powerful to be able to take those stories from the Foreign Service Nationals and share that with the US officers, not to chide them or berate them, but just to say, you, you may not be aware of this, right? But it's aligning our good intentions with the impact that we have on others. And again, bringing in that power dynamic, who is in a seat of power within this organizational structure and how is that impacting and influencing your relationships and ultimately the outcomes you're getting from your colleagues, from your staff. So it was really fascinating to be, be able to bring not only that intercultural element, but also the DEI experience into uh, the conversations with foreign service nationals. And I, I think that's such a critical piece when we talk about inclusion. You know, I think for so many years, inclusion really translated to assimilation. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and unfortunately that has, uh, 
And I think that's still the the issue and even just like US based companies. But when then you take on that global view and it's even more uh you know kind of diverse in the way that people are approaching things. So I I like that you're talking about this and I like that this is something that is highlighted. I think that you know it's interesting. I just had a recent situation where I was talking to a senior leader and we were talking about a, a all hands meeting that had occurred and he was kind of commenting that one of the folks that spoke who is uh originally from Germany, well he mm -hmm. does, he's not a very good speaker. And I said, "Well, here's the thing. He is literally translating everything in his head before it comes out of his mouth, so it's in English." Wow. So you know let's let's see what he's like when he's speaking in german and you know it's you know his not you know his first language um and it was just an interesting conversation and then you know literally like and two days later we were in a meeting and one of the women on the call was like yeah i'm messaging in slack in german and talking to you all in english and <laughs> So, you know, pardon me if I, you know, start switching languages. Yeah. And it is one of those things like even that basic language piece that, you know, as we're talking to the, you know, the the foreign national folks, like if they're not in an, a, you know, English speaking country, mm -hmm. we are expecting them to speak English, which, you know, is not their first language, but also expecting them to get all of the nuances of our crazy English language. Exactly. <laughs> I, I was actually, I, I used the expression low hanging fruit the other day with some folks in um, Bulgaria and they were like, what is that? <laughs> and I was like, okay, sorry, give me a minute. <laughs> yes. It's, it is those, those nuances that, that can really lead. And that's just the language piece alone. That's not talking even the cultural pieces and some of those other other are the things that kind of come to mind, but I love that. So as you're working with an organization, you know, when you first go into the organization, what is your approach to, you know, kind of uh, getting to know what those issues are, getting to know, um, you know, the best way to approach it? We always start with some layer of assessment of data gathering. Uh, because we need to understand the landscape and the, the existing culture and also to be able to dive deeper into how different individuals representing different identity groups uh, are experiencing that culture. A lot of times what I found is that we'll have the initial call with somebody in human resources or in senior leadership and their perspective and how they describe the organization and the challenges it faces may or may not always be aligned with how others are experiencing the organization. And so we will, you know, we'll take that data, but then we'll also say we need to do a survey. Mm -hmm. Ideally, we want to do some individual conversations and focus groups. Um, some of the most uh, powerful focus groups that we've done have been dialogues where we've created affinity spaces for people, you know, whether that is um, black indigenous people of color, whether it is women, whether it is LGBTQ plus folks, uh, or whatever, whatever is needed in order to gather insights from folks who perhaps are part of an identity group that is either in the minority or has had a different experience. And sometimes that's related to how long they've been with the organization. We have one organization that we've been working with where we had an affinity a dialogue group for people who have been with the, the company for five years or less, because they said, it's so interesting, every place else I've worked, after about six months, you're sort of like, you're in. Mm -hmm. But here, three years in, you're still being called a newbie. You're still not being given those opportunities to show your abilities because you don't yet have enough uh, and I think actually the, the leader of this organization actually referred to it as you haven't earned your stripes yet. So again, these very interesting, not so subtle uh, mm -hmm. cultural norms that can have a significant impact on who, whose voice is valued, who has opportunities for growth and mobility and so on and so forth. Um, so once we do that information gathering, then we'll, we'll look for themes especially if there are some of those demographic variances and then share that with the leadership uh, along with our recommendations. Here's, you know, based on what we have heard and seen and what we know works uh, within organizations like yours that are experiencing these, these same challenges, this is what we think you need. Um, 
I don't know if this has been your experience, Katie, but uh, oftentimes there's uh, when we present those findings, it's a little bit of a, a gut check for the folks in senior leadership positions because they may not have been aware of either those gaps or challenges or the the uh, the level to which those gaps and challenges are really getting in the way of people feeling included, feeling engaged, feeling like they can bring their full selves to work. So sometimes you have to deal with a little bit of uh, defensiveness. Oh, yes. Deflection. I'm, I've, I've dealt with a lot of intellectual deflection from people yes. saying, well, I'm very data driven and, and like, well, here's the data. <laughs> Absolutely. So, so that's always kind of the starting point. And then that also gives us information about how ready is the organization, especially at the leadership level, to do the work that's really required. Because we don't want to be a part of an initiative that is going to be window dressing, that isn't going to, you know, if, if we're coming in and, you know, just by coming in and being the consultant, we feel like we're making a contract, not only with the client, with the leadership, but we're making a, a contract of trust with the employees by asking them these questions, by stating these recommendations. And so if, if the organization is not committed to being in this for the long haul, then we feel like we're not doing our due diligence. We're not, we're not, uh, holding that trust for the employees. So that's something that we take very seriously before we even decide if we're going to move forward and continue our partnership. Great careers are forged out of great relationships. Your success, whatever your field, relies and thrives on the support and insights of others. I'm Andy Laparta, an author and speaker on the power of professional relationships. In the Connected Leadership podcast, I have the privilege of interviewing people from around the world to understand the relationships that have made a difference on their journey and how their insights can help you. From Nobel Prize winners to Olympians, from NASA astronauts to peace campaigners, my guests have shared some captivating moments from their lives and careers. Combined with experts from leading universities, cutting-edge authors and giants of business, the Connected Leadership Podcast aims to inspire, educate, and entertain. I, I'm so happy to hear that. And I think it's good for our listeners to hear it as well, because I think this is one of the challenges that, that I have noticed. I have you know, some leaders that are like, oh, can I sit in on the listening sessions or the feedback sessions? Or HR folks are like, I want to sit in on the, the feedback sessions. And I tell them no. And it and it is because, you know, I am an outsider. I don't know who these folks are. I don't have, you know, maybe some bias or some uh, other thoughts that might cloud what I'm hearing from them. And, and so it is always interesting to me to, to come in with that fresh set of eyes. And to your point, so many times you're bringing stuff back to the leadership team that they're like, well, that wasn't my experience. And you're like, right? I'm sure it wasn't. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so it's always it's always good to hear, and you know, yes, it's anecdotal information, and you're not, you know, you're hopefully speaking to a certain percentage of the the group, but it is so fascinating to hear what the experience is for folks that are coming in in a you know frontline role or a, a junior role, like the example you just gave of, hey, I've been here for three years, but I'm still considered a newbie, and you know, and what that kind of stigma uh, like puts on a person and for me it's always tying back also to business results so yes. here's here's why this is an issue but here's the impact as well so it's always fascinating to have those conversations i like that um when you uh when you are working with organizations are there you know are there certain things that you have seen recently are there certain things that have popped that maybe have are different than what they were five years ago, 10 years ago, are there certain topics that um, are more front of mind for folks when you're having those conversations and those, you know, feedback sessions, listening sessions, whatever you want to call them? I definitely think that there is much more openness and willingness to explore race and racial injustice at a deeper level than I've ever seen before. And that is really that's really exciting and encouraging to me uh, there. And, and really, I mean, you know, it's unfortunate that that came about because of 
the killings of George Floyd and Ahmaud Arbery and Breonna Taylor and so many others, you know, it's just the, the, the list goes on and on. Um, but I, I do see a, the, the aperture has opened. And at the same time, I think what is equally present is the fear around the politicization of DEI initiatives uh, with, you know, the, the sort of the backlash and the anti-woke movement. And so there's, there's a great deal of heightened anxiety around uh, how do we make sure that we're quote unquote doing this right? Right. And I don't want to say or do the wrong thing. I'm afraid of being seen as political if I make a statement. Um, and that's something that I'm sure has existed before, but I didn't see it as as much as mm -hmm. I'm seeing now. And I think that's just indicative of where we are as a society. We're so incredibly polarized. And because even the idea and the concept of diversity, equity, inclusion has been uh, misconstrued, uh, intentionally to make it feel as though it's divisive and it's inequitable and it's exclusionary when it's actually, you know, it's, it's, it's the opposite of all of those things. Um, I also see, I think, an, a, a, an increasing awareness that just coming in and doing like a one hour presentation on unconscious bias is not enough. And yes, absolutely. We still get those calls. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, Increasingly, I am seeing some patterns and trends as organizational leaders are realizing, wow, we've got, you know, the existing workforce, especially the, the, new, the newer members of the workforce, the future leaders of all of our industries are coming in with a heightened level of exposure to and understanding of and acceptance of differences and, an, and a desire to see their organizations, really a demand to see their organizations take a social stand, be more progressive. And so I think there still is a lot of, uh, there's still a lot of grittiness around that. There's still a lot of digging in the heels because that sort of status quo bias to just kind of keep going back to the way things have always been is hard to let go of. Mm -hmm. But there is, in my mind, a slowly evolving and increasing realization from people at the top levels of their organizations that if we don't take this and do it in a meaningful way, we are not going to be viable uh, employers of choice. We're not going to be, uh, we're not going to be viable uh, vendors. Uh, we're going to lose out ultimately on consume on a major corners of the consumer market um you know even just it's pride month right and so even just thinking about the lgbtqia plus community and what we've seen in the news just in the last you know couple of weeks and months around some of these major retailers walking back their commitments mm -hmm. to the lgbtqia plus community um which is so short-sighted especially from a bottom line vantage point because you know, that community is the largest minority population, growing minority population in the country. It's got like over $1.4 trillion spending power. I mean, it's just, it's insane to me when you talk about the, the, the bottom line, right? And the business yeah. case for DEI, that organizational leaders continue to cave to these pressures to not be political when in reality, what they're doing is just shooting themselves in the foot. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think that's the part I that's kind of where I was going to go next. And so thank you kind of for opening this door, because I, I think that's one of the pieces that, to your point, is very short sighted. So, you know, as as a consultant, as someone that is, you know, people call to say, what should we do in this? You know, and I'm sure you get those calls all the time. Hey, this just happened. How should we respond to it? what are your thoughts and you know what are your what's your advice to companies that are facing that backlash that are you know getting uh anti-woke messaging or whatever you want to call it which i can't even stand that, that phrase it's so dumb um but <laughs> what what is your advice to those organizations that are that are facing that that kind of political uh, like the political weaponizing whatever you want to call it of this work I, so three things immediately come to mind. One is uh, if you are going to step forth in your commitments as, you know, in, in terms of allyship uh, and, and take a stand for the social progress, whether we're talking about Black Lives Matter, whether we're talking about, uh, you know, gender equality, 
uh, pride, so on and so forth. Um, one, just expect the backlash. This should not be a surprise to anybody at this point in time. And you better have a really good crisis comms team with some DEI experts on there who can prepare that messaging in advance and prepare the leadership to be able to get out there and stand strong in their messaging and their why. Always tying it back to mission, vision, values, what our company stands for and why this is so important. Two, don't back down. Um, you know, I, the, the backtracking actually leads to such an erosion of trust that it can be much more damaging than standing strong. And oftentimes, you know, for those companies that have stood strong and said, you know, we're just going to ignore the, the haters and, and just keep, keep our, our communications and our messaging focused on why this is valuable, why it's important, um, and that we stand by it, then the, those voices go away. They go and find somebody else to attack eventually. Um, and three, I think it is uh, focus on long-term outcomes rather than these short-term uh, reactive fixes or backtracks. Uh, again, thinking about the consumer buying power, the, the, the long-term focus on being an employer of choice for the future generations, um, holding on to that. And, and, and also for leaders to make sure that they have those numbers that they've done, that they've calculated those metrics so that they can share that with their boards, so that mm -hmm. they can share that with their shareholders or whoever may, they, you know, their donors, if it's a, if it's a nonprofit organization, but um, be ready to, to make that case for why these long-term um, outcomes are going to require us to stand strong now in this area. Well, I think it goes back for me. Um, first of all, those are all I, I love all three of those. I, I and the, what it goes back for me is also the what side of history do you want to be on? Oh. Um, you know, and I think that's one of the things that, you know, I worked for one of the large retailers that uh, is getting quite a bit of backlash mm -hmm. right now. Um, and, you know, and I'm talking to my friends that are still there and that erosion of trust that has occurred in the last, you know, month or so. Um, that's the part, you know, you mentioned kind of that employer of choice of the future. And I, I think we're going to see some hiccups in that, you know, in that lane that, you know, that area, because of the fact that, you know, you were this employer that everyone knew it was safe and that you were, you had the backs of folks that were in these marginalized groups and do you really though? And so I, I think that's the piece that is interesting to me. And it is interesting that, you know, companies that have been very much upfront and visible in these conversations, that they are stepping back now. And it is, it's unfortunate because it, it like you said, it's the, yeah, you might see a dip in sales for the next few months, but then people move on to something else. And, and, you know, I, I, I just think it's unfortunate that people can't see that long term at times when you're in the thick of it, which I think all of us have been guilty of where, you know, you it, you're facing, uh, you know, the the scariness of, oh, my gosh, we're in trouble and everyone's all over social media and everyone's all, you know, talking about us in not a great way. Now what? So I love the 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 three ideas, because I think, yeah, having someone having that crisis management team that's able to say, here's what you say when this happens, or here's how you respond. All of that is just so critical. And, you know, I think for anyone that's in HR that has dealt with a reduction in force, and obviously that's very, you know, very much front of mind for HR folks right now, but you, you sit down and you put together a FAQ, you sit down and say, what if this happens? You sit down and you like have the, the what's the worst that could happen process for that very reason so that you can go how do we make sure that we are prepared for anything that might come from this conversation or you know this action so i i love those ideas and they can really be applied in this but in so many other areas as well so thank you for sharing those so if you are um if you're working with a leadership change that is your leadership team that is facing these types of changes or just changes overall i think again so many companies are in this 
transformation or how do we do this differently? How do you think about like the future of work? How do you think about, you know, some of these pieces as well that people that are looking for roles now aren't just focused on, you know, what are the results? What are they, you know, what do we see on the the ticker, you know, on, on the bottom of the screen or whatever? So how do you think about that? One of the things that I've been incorporating into my my training and my coaching with leaders and executives is uh, so Robert Keegan and Lisa Leahy, who are uh, uh, authors and academics uh, at Harvard Business School, wrote a book called Immunity to Change. And it's such a simple idea, but I think it's really powerful that all of us tend to, especially when we are experiencing or trying to initiate major change, we have our stated commitments, right? This is what I intentionally and I explicitly want to do. This is the outcome I'm driving toward. Then looking at taking a step back and asking, well, what are the actions that I'm taking that might actually be getting in my way of that success? Or what are the things I'm not doing that might be getting in the way of this thing that I say I want? Um, why is that, right? And so being able to dive down and discover what some of those hidden competing commitments are. Um, not because we're bad people or because we are ignorant, but simply because we have certain patterns and whether that's patterns of behaviors or cultural norms that have been a part of just the way things are for so long that sometimes it's hard for us to let go of them. Uh, and they're often based on something that has given us some kind of reward in the past, um, or at least led us to feel sort of safe and there was a level of certainty to it. And there's often some underlying assumptions that we need to raise to the surface and explore and test and say, okay, so if this is what we state that we really want, what do we need to either start doing differently or stop doing because it's getting in our way? Um, and I think we need to address that with leaders at both the institutional level but also at the individual level. The, the biggest thing that I see um, is needed when it comes to true DEI transformation, actually two things. One is it's got to start with leaders and it has to start at the internal level. They need to realize because conditions of such power, whether they feel that power or not, um, that they have the most work uh, often that needs to be done to shift that culture. And two, in order to uh, track those changes, we need to have some sense of what are the outcomes that we are trying to achieve. One of the biggest challenges that I've seen with organizations trying to measure progress is that they focus on outputs, activities, events, trainings, heritage months, creating a DEI committee, so on and so forth. But what are the outcomes that you're driving toward and how would you know that you're making progress towards them? So I think focusing on that immunity to change and what we're doing or not doing that's getting in our way helps us to discover what are the outcomes we're really trying to achieve and how do we get there? Um, and so those are the things that I think are really important for leaders at this point in time to, to struggle with a little bit. This work is hard. It's ongoing. This is not something that is going to be done in a year, two years, five years. This needs to be seen as a critical strategic framework for the success of any organization, regardless of its mission. I love that. And, and I think, you know, the, what, you know, of all the things you just said, I think one of the things that just really struck me is I, I've seen, and Jackie will tell you, she's not a huge fan of like employee resource groups. Um, she's not been shy about that on this podcast, <laughs> or how, you know, when we when talking to friends, whatnot. Um, and I think part of that is because it does feel like performative, just action to see action. But what what is that actually doing to impact folks? How is that actually making a difference to the organization, to the structure, all of those things? And so I, I think looking at the measurements and what those measurements should be, can be, because I agree with you wholeheartedly. A lot of it is, oh, what's our demographic information? How has that changed? And I, I, I think you probably get this question. Uh, you know, what, what should we be? What metrics should we be tracking? What should we be looking at? Mm -hmm. And I think that's a challenge for folks at times. So when, when you're working with an organization, what are some of the metrics that you think are critical 
to be looking at, obviously, aside from basic demographic info? Yeah. So in addition to representation, I always push my clients to look at representation of diversity at every level and within every job function. Mm -hmm. Overwhelmingly, what we have seen, especially in the last few years, is that there has been, in many instances, an increase in representation of people of color, for example. And yet it's often the, 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 that population tends to be at entry level positions. Mm -hmm. And they're often, especially as you were saying earlier, you know, in terms of reduction of force, as many organizations have been contracting um, due to economic financial issues, they're the first people cut. So that also erodes trust in the organization. So I think um, looking at this in terms of how are we recruiting at all levels, how are we building that pipeline um, for su and succession plan so that we know that not only this year or next year, but 10 years down the road, we are going to have the type of workforce that is truly reflective of our society. Um, in terms of measuring equity and inclusion, I think it's actually much, I don't want to say it's much easier than people give it credit for, but we all know what it feels like to be a part of an organization where we feel that sense of home, of familiarity, of belonging, where we feel valued. Um, and there are questions that we can ask that help us gauge who feels that, right? Do you feel visible? Do you feel like you can be uh, your full self when you come into the workplace? Do you feel like your opinions are valued? Uh, do you feel that sense of belonging? Um, do you have adequate input into decisions that are going to impact you? So on and so forth. Um, in terms of equity, we can look at policies and see who are they serving? Who are they centered around? Who might be missing? Whether that is related to uh, folks' religious needs, uh, whether it's related to uh, new parents, whether it's related to um, people who are caring for elders. Uh, we've already seen a lot of those changes uh, happen in terms of our HR policies. And I think just continuing to identify what those best practices are and then taking it one step further. Uh, and and being proactive, not just doing the bare minimum, right? right. Um, but I do think that there, there are ways for us to, to measure this. It really comes down to, again, asking ourselves, what are the outcomes that we're trying to drive toward? And what would be the, the measures along the way that would tell us that we're making progress? Um, and, and it doesn't mean that we can't be measuring outputs, but I also think it's measuring the quality versus the quantity of those outputs. So if you're saying, well, we're, we're doing this series of training programs around DEI for, um, you know, for all of our workforce, great. What are they learning? How are you measuring behavior change? Uh, are you doing especially doing 360s at the leadership and management levels to and with specific competencies related to DEI? So that's measurement. We can see are people saying that they're seeing a change in how their supervisors are engaging with them and others. Um, so I think that there's a lot that a lot of different ways in which we can measure that it does require some effort, it requires resources, and it requires either. Uh, you know, hiring external expertise to come in and do that work or hiring somebody internally to do that work with that expertise. And that's the last thing that I think is often missing. There are a lot of people out there who bring a deep amount of commitment and passion and desire to do this work, but don't have the skills yet to be able to do it in that nuanced way. Mm -hmm. And that can sometimes it sets them up to fail when we put them into positions that they're not that they don't have the resources or the skills to be able to deliver on. Um, and we actually can it can lead to some negative consequences for the organization in terms of its DEI efforts. So I really think that we need to be focusing more on providing the, the appropriate skills and resources for people who do want to become DEI practitioners to understand what it really takes to do this work in a meaningful way to embed it in the organizational structure and culture um, and to go beyond the performative that we were talking about. Imagine how fast we could solve the world's biggest problems if more SaaS startups would gain traction sooner. Welcome to the Tech Entrepreneur on a Mission podcast. 
This podcast is dedicated to sharing experiences from B2B SaaS CEOs who are going above and beyond to deliver change that is noticed. You will hear their secrets and learn what is required to build a SaaS business that the world starts talking about and keeps talking about and how to overcome the roadblocks to do so. Absolutely. And I, I think, you know, we saw this, you know, happen uh, quite a bit right around that 2021 timeframe where folks were putting out their shingle of, hey, I'm a, a DEI consultant and I cannot tell you the amount of companies that I got calls from or emails from of, hey, we brought this person in, they broke all the things and 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 it is that, you know, luckily they are still reaching out and still trying to make a change because I've also seen come that, hey, we try this, it didn't work, so we're just not going to talk about it anymore. Um, and I think that that critical piece of working with folks that actually have done this, and and that's not to say that new consultants coming out can't be, you know, can't do this work. It's more just making sure they have the skill set to understand what are those nuances? What are those cultural things? What are the pieces? And so for anyone that is, you know, just starting out, I, I, I always like to speak to new consultants that are coming into this space just to, you know, give them cautionary tales, but then also give them, here are some things you really want to keep in mind at all times. Um, and, it, and I think it's also, and we all know this, this is hard. <laughs> it's really, really hard work. Um, and, you know, and the patience and the heaviness and all of these things that you're dealing with are, it's really critical to make sure that you are thinking about all of that and, and building your network of folks that you can reach out to in those times when you're like, why did I decide to do this? What was I thinking? Um, but, you know, I think those are some of the things too. So I, I love that you're, you're bringing that up. But I, I think the, the challenge and the uh the work it's so worth it mm -hmm. when we can see you know the the work that we're doing actually start to have outcomes and i'm going to go back to something that you mentioned earlier you know a test and you know i think that's something that so many folks think they have to make these grand changes and you know do these you know big blow up, hey, we're going to, you know, blow up the whole thing. But I think those tests, those pilots, those small tweaks can make such a huge difference in the long term. And, and yes, it can be, hey, let's take all the managers through a bias training as one step. That's not the step. <laughs> it's one step. And, you know, and it's how do you build on that? Because it can't be a one and done conversation. Um, I actually do a, a, a I facilitate a, a workshop and it is it, one of the lines that I say, and I think most of us do say this, I cannot cure you of your bias in this <laughs> two hours, you know, sorry, I wish I could. Um, can't, can't fix mine either. It's just there. Um, and so I think that's great that, you know, you, you bring those things up because I think that's something that is a, a challenge for folks of uh, wanting to get it done and get it done quickly. And this isn't a sprint. This is absolutely a marathon. Absolutely. And I love what you said too about that this is hard work and we do need to find ways to build community so folks don't feel so isolated and don't get burnt out because even the most highly skilled DEI practitioners have those moments where it's like, I, I can't do this anymore, right? If we lose that spark, <laughs> it's really hard to gain it back. And um, so I think we really have to focus on being there for each other uh, in whatever way, shape or form that takes. But um, the fatigue is real. Absolutely. Oh, for sure. So uh, I would love to sit and just chat with you for more <laughs> hours. because <laughs> I love this conversation, but would love for you to share you know, what's one thing or one or two things that you want to make sure our listeners hear, you know, so the leaders and the HR practitioners that are listening to the episode, what would you like them to hear from this? I think going back to that uh, just recent conversation that we were having around the fatigue and how challenging this work is, is that all of us who are invested in this, whether it's as formal practitioners or informally, we need to do our own work. And we can't just do it once. It needs to be something that we're constantly revisiting. Whatever identities I bring with me into the spaces, 
uh, I have my own internal processing and reflection that I need to do about my, like you said, my biases, as well as just my lived experiences and how those are shaping my perceptions and my interpretations of today. Um, all of us, I think, have an immense amount of work. And this feels to me like my personal sort of obligation to our society to find ways to build connections because we are so polarized. And that also requires an immense amount of effort mental, physical, <laughs> emotional, um, but to be able to suspend my own judgments of people who don't see the world the same way I do, who perhaps are not at the same stage of this journey that I'm at, it's very easy for me to become impatient and lose my curiosity. And so that's something that I think all of us need to be really reflecting and working on. Um, I wrote a, a book, Diversity, Equity, Inclusion for Trainers, uh, fostering DEI in the workplace. And that was actually, I devoted a whole chapter to, we need to start with us um, before we can get out there and be working with others. Um, we really need to know what we're bringing with us into these spaces. Absolutely. I, I think, you know, the, it is very hard to not center yourself in any conversation, but especially in this conversation when, um, you do see so many different challenges, you know, that, that folks are going through and some of them you can relate to some of them you can't, but keeping the work centered on the folks that you're working with is such a critical piece. So thank you for calling that out. Um, you know, for me, I think that I, I'm going to go back to, uh, you know, something that you said a little bit earlier, the leaders need to be involved in this conversation and not just from a, face of the conversation, but also resources. And, you know, Jackie and I talk quite often about, you know, you actually have a, but you, you need to have a budget for this. And we know that a lot of companies have dropped this, uh, you know, dropped DEI as a budget line item because it's, hey, we have other things to focus on or, hey, you know, politics, all of these other pieces. And I, I think to your point, it's even more critical now because of all the polarization that's going on. So, uh, for those of you who are practitioners doing this work, please keep your head up. And, you know, I, I want to reiterate, find your network and, you know, I, I, I will not to put words in your mouth, Maria, reach out to Maria or myself if you need to talk. <laughs> um, but also, you know, make sure that you just have those folks that you can step away from the work and decompress with. Cause I think that's just another critical piece to this is, is making sure that you're as you said earlier, looking at yourself and, and making sure you're okay, but then also making sure you're continuing to learn along this journey. So mm -hmm. Maria, thank you. Uh, totally appreciate this conversation. Thank you for taking the time to, to chat with me. And um, we'll you know definitely share this out with our folks. Uh, this is Katie Van Horn. Uh, thank you so much for listening. Bye. Attracting, recruiting, and retaining great talent has never been harder. But why? We know we need them, and they need us. So why are we making it harder? Pull up a chair, listen, and laugh along with Alyn Bailey and Tracy Parsons as they dissect the industry, solve problems, and scoff at and sass the status quo. Join the rebellion with the Talent Rebelcast and question everything you know about the world of work.